My name is John Fain. I'm here wearing my hat as a Vice-Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Melbourne. And I'm deeply humbled and honoured to play that important role tonight. I'd like you to welcome Uncle Andrew Gardner, an Aboriginal Muslim Australian and Wurundjeri elder, co-chair of the board of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation, the traditional owners and registered Aboriginal party for Greater Melbourne. He was elected to the First Peoples Assembly here in Victoria to represent the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people in one of the 10 reserved seats allocated for traditional owner groups. And I'd like you to welcome him, please, to the microphone. Good evening. How are we? This way. Half the audience with mask, half without. It's an interesting evening. But there's a couple of things I want to share with everybody at the start. Uh, I'm actually deputy chair of the uh, Wurundjeri Corporation, uh, but co-chair of the uh, interim elders' voice with the uh, First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. So that's engaging elders from around the state to participate in treaty and take up their leadership role to progress treaty in their local areas. I can see quite a few people that I recognise in the audience. Thank you very much for coming. Um, but like I said last night to a uh, forum, there's uh, three things that I wanted to get across and uh, hopefully people can accept those. Uh, one is that the Wurundjeri Wurrung Corporation and members uh, supported uh, the name change of uh, Merribeck City Council from uh, the previous name, which had association with global slavery, racism and purposeful dispossession particularly from our people, because we had that initial impact. Now, the second thing I wanted to mention was that the Wurundjeri Wurrung Corporation does not support the uh, state government's proposition about changing the name of Maroonda Hospital. Maroonda Hospital is the only hospital in Victoria that's got an Aboriginal name. It just happens to be a Wurrung as well. And... If anybody's signed that petition out there, thank you very much. Now, the last thing is about treaty. And uh, being on the First People's Assembly, it has the responsibility to try and create the foundations for individual communities' treaties, aspirations, uh, and their way they negotiate with the state government. So uh, back in June, the Treaty Authority Bill was put through state parliament. It was signed off in August. That was a landmark. The Treaty Authority Bill is about, well, the Treaty Authority is about the, uh, the umpire for any disputes. The second thing was the Treaty Negotiating Framework, and the third thing was the Soft Determination Fund. Those last two were signed off by the State Government at a cultural session next to the Yarra, the Burrung River, um, uh, just a few weeks ago. So there's three heavy components to treaty that all of our communities can take advantage of and progress their individual treaties, but we need our elders to particularly participate. And uh, hopefully that'll be taken up. The Wurundjeri Wurrung's traditional country extends from the Werribee River in the west to past the Great Dividing Range in the north, Kilmore, Woodend, east to Mount Borbore, and Mordialic Creek to the south. That might be a little bit contentious for some, but part of that's the truths that were traditions handed on to us by our elders and our ancestors. The things that our elders and ancestors tell us we believe as being true, because we had an oral history. We didn't have things written down that we could refer back to to make sure people didn't get it wrong. So we believe what our elders say. 
And that's our tradition. Everything in between that area is traditional Wurundjeri country. So, as we always do, we always pay our respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. And to other elders here tonight, we also say welcome. In our traditional language of the Wurrung, Wumunjika. Wumunjika means welcome. Wumunjika Yemen Kundi Bik, Wurundjeri Wurrung Balak, which means welcome to the traditional lands, traditional country of the Wurundjeri clans of the Wurrung people. And uh, make note that these these traditions always need to be followed. Uh, so I'll leave that with you and say thank you very much for allowing us to participate in such an important uh, document which we, as Wolverine people, contributed to. We had attendees at this particular event. And it's a great thing to see that um, even the hint of a referendum from the Commonwealth is possible, but um, they're going to couch it really well. And it needs to uh, be better than the 1967 referendum. So, leave that with you. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Uncle Andrew, and I too pay my respects, and also express my personal impatience for treaty or treaties to try and repair some of the damage of our colonial past. What a remarkable document we have, a living, breathing representation of aspiration for the future of our country. It's like an indigenous Magna Carta. It's, I find myself quite emotional just being in the presence of this extraordinary parchment. We'll hear much more about it. We'll hear from the University of Melbourne Vice-Chancellor Duncan Maskell in a moment. He'll introduce Archie Law from the Sydney Peace Prize. Then we'll hear from Megan Davis. And then we'll have a chance for a, a conversation about the substance of her delivery. And then the Lord Mayor Sally Capp will thank her. And then we have a fantastic performance for you as well. And uh, John Wayne Parsons will fill the room, fill the hall with some wonderful music. Professor Duncan Maskell is the 20th Vice-Chancellor of the, the University of Melbourne, arriving from the University of Cambridge, where his research specialty was infectious diseases. He's also enjoyed an active entrepreneurial career and co-founded four biotech companies amongst his many accomplishments. He's an independent, non-executive director of CSL, a board member of the Melbourne Business School, the Melbourne Theatre Company, the Grattan Institute, the Group of Eight and Universities Australia. And he will introduce Archie Law, the chair of the Sydney Peace Foundation, which presents the annual Sydney Peace Prize now in its 24th year. Archie's also saved the Children Australia's director of international programs, under his leadership at the foundation, the Sydney Peace Prize has been awarded to the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, to Professor Joseph Stiglitz, the Me Too movement, and this year, to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Professor Duncan Maskell, could you please welcome him to the microphone? Thank you very much, John. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and from which we come, particularly the Wurundjeri and Boon people and the other peoples of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to Indigenous elders past and present. And I especially pay my respect to Andrew, Uncle Andrew, for his welcome to country this evening. I also acknowledge all Indigenous people here in the Melbourne Town Hall this evening. I acknowledge distinguished guests particularly tonight's orator, Professor Megan Davis, Pat Anderson AO, who will join Professor Davis in the discussion to follow, the chair of the Sydney Peace Foundation, Mr. Archie Law, and the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Capp. 
It really is a great honor for me to say a brief word of welcome this evening. I think I can speak for the opinion of everyone here in saying that we are living through an acutely important moment in the history of Australia. With many halts and obstacles along the way, there has been a long running movement in Australia's history towards truth telling, justice for the first peoples, and a coming to maturity for the whole nation as it honestly faces its past of violence and oppression towards Indigenous peoples and the continuing consequences of that past. This movement has gained momentum this year and tonight's gathering at Melbourne Town Hall is another step along the way as we listen to those calling for justice and a better future. I was very privileged to be present at another such moment at the Garma Festival at Gulkala in Arnhem Land last August, and indeed to say a few words there also, on the very day that the Prime Minister of Australia announced a referendum to take place during the present term of the National Parliament. At Garma, we witnessed both the Prime Minister of Australia and a lineup of new ministers, including the new Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney. They spoke about the long overdue need for constitutional reform to realise a voice makarata and truth-telling, so that Indigenous Australians have their rightful place in the nation as the first peoples, their ancestors having been here for at least 65,000 years. I hope the Prime Minister and all who support this goal can find a way through the difficulties of the path ahead, and indeed that all Indigenous people find a way to come to agreement about how best to do this. But do this we must. This is a moment in history, and we've got to grasp it with all of our hands. I speak as a migrant who has come to love this country when I say that I feel the power of the words of the Uluru Statement, calling for substantive constitutional change and structural reform, and for the ancient sovereignty of the First Peoples to shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. The University of Melbourne, my university, is strongly committed, not only to the Commonwealth of Australia's constitutional reform process, but also to working closely with Indigenous people around Australia to advance this agenda. For the university, this co commitment includes empowering our Indigenous staff to participate in the debate at local, regional and national levels. Our commitment is to do everything we can as a university to support an informed national conversation, leading to a successful establishment of an Indigenous voice to Parliament. I think one particular and important role that institutions, including universities like mine, can play is in leading debate to help governments and the public alike to have the best advice and the most reliable information available to make the best decisions in the interests of all future Australians indigenous and non-indigenous alike. Coming together to support initiatives such as tonight's meeting with our colleagues at the Sydney Peace Foundation, as well as the City of Melbourne, as well as many others, and of course with our distinguished guest speaker, is a prime example of how this can be achieved. I applaud the work of the Sydney Peace Foundation in bringing the community together each year to talk about peace, justice and non-violence and to honour inspiring peacemakers. This year, the University of Melbourne is absolutely delighted to join with the Foundation in doing so through tonight's event at the Melbourne Town Hall. Let us all use the energy of this public meeting to do the utmost that we can to advance this vital national agenda and to see it succeed. I now invite Archie Law to the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Duncan, and uh, thank you to you and also to the Lord Mayor uh, for hosting this event this evening. Um, we greatly appreciate that. Um, and as a, a son of this city, uh, even though I chair the Sydney Peace Foundation, uh, delighted to be with you tonight. Uh, the Sydney Peace Foundation is a, a foundation of the University of Sydney, and We've been absolutely thrilled to award the 2022 Sydney Peace Prize to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. 
The statement was selected by a jury from over 200 nominations, and the jury's deliberations this, for this year have landed its decision in exactly the right place. The prize has been accepted by Professor Megan Davis and Pat Anderson, AO, on behalf of the, the whole team that was responsible for drafting the statement for everyone who participated in the, the regional dialogues. Um, Noel Pearson has also been uh, awarded the Sydney Peace Prize. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Noel's not well at the moment um, and sends his apologies um, and we wish him well and a full and speedy recovery. Megan, Pat and Noel have been awarded the prize for bringing together Australia's First Nations people around a clear and comprehensive agenda for healing and peace within our nation and delivering self-determination for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that enables Australia to move into the future united and confident. Pat and Megan are two of my heroes. Uh, they are national treasures. I want to thank them for their leadership, their commitment to making this country a fairer and more just place, their optimism in spite of near overwhelming odds at times, and the love they have of country, culture, and the people of this land. So I thank them both. These women have been striving for peace with justice for decades. And this is important because true peace only comes about when there is also justice. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart is an extraordinary peace offering to all Australian people. The statement is extraordinary, not just because of the just future it envisages, but because it asks all of us to be part of making peace together. And we are not at peace when we stand on lands that have been forcefully taken, when there have been more than 500 deaths in custody, with not a single conviction since the Royal Commission finished its work in 1991, and when a young boy cannot safely walk home from school. We're not living in a country of peace. But here's the thing. A voice for First Nations people, powerfully enshrined in our constitution, will give us all that chance to step forward together. And the offer, the humble and powerful ask of the Uluru Statement, is what we all choose to take that pathway. We can't squander this chance. The Sydney Peace Prize, which is Australia's only international prize for peace, we can fix that, Melbourne, has honoured this pathway to peace in our own land. And Australians are ready to vote yes at an eagerly awaited referendum on a First Nations voice to Parliament. Yet we don't often talk about it, but we Australians have a, a rich tradition of embracing change, being one of the first countries in the world to enable women to vote, the eight-hour working day, to Doc Evatt leading the formation of the United Nations and taking renowned uh, advocate, women's rights advocate, but also strong advocate for the Indigenous people of, of this land, Jessie Street, to that conference, um, who drove the inclusion of gender as a non-discrimination clause into the UN Charter, to the 1967 referendum, to marriage equality. We Australians embrace change and we'll do it again. Because this is all on us. It's us who have the power to make this change through voting yes and sharing our support. And today, that's our ask. We're asking you to make that commitment of support. 
to have the conversations at home, with your friends, at work, and even with the grumpy old bugger down the road to make this change happen. History is calling. Thank you. Thank you, Archie and Duncan. I'd like you, please, to welcome to the stage Professor Megan Davis and Pat Anderson, and in spirit, if not in flesh, also Noel Pearson. Could you please make them very welcome? Let's take a moment. Professor Megan Davis is a cobble cobble woman and pro vice chancellor of society and Balnave's chair in constitution law at the University of New South Wales. An acting commissioner of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, she was a member of the Referendum Council and the experts panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands people in the constitution. She's an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and is currently a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council's Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In 2022, she was appointed to the Referendum Working Group and the Referendum Engagement Group, and she is co-chair of the Uluru Dialogue. Pat Anderson, AO, is an Aliyawara woman known nationally and internationally as a powerful advocate for the health of Australia's First Peoples. She has extensive experience in Aboriginal health, including community development, policy formulation and research ethics. She served as co-chair of the Referendum Council, is the current chair of the Remote Area Health Corporation and chairs the Lowitcher Institute. Pat Anderson is the inaugural patron of WASCA, the Women's Safety Services of Central Australia, was appointed Officer of the Order of Australia in 2014 for distinguished service to the Indigenous community as a social justice advocate. And these are two remarkable and genuine leaders of not just there, but all of our peoples. Could you please again welcome them? The format is that Megan will speak to us and then I'll conduct a conversation with both Pat and Megan before we move on to the rest of the evening's program. I'd like to invite Megan to the lectern, please. Thank you. It is a great honour to receive the Sydney Peace Prize for the Uluru Statement from the Heart on behalf of Pat Anderson, Noel Pearson and myself. I would also like to acknowledge Mark Liebler, who was the co-chair of the Referendum Council. We also recognise and celebrate the men and women of the Uluru Dialogues, and I pay well, our gratitude and respect to those dialogue mob who have passed since. And personally, I would like to acknowledge the extraordinary Pat Anderson. Noel agrees that without Pat's inimitable leadership style, this would not have happened. The Uluru Statement from the Heart and the law reforms contained in it, Voice Makarata, was a game changer for the nation. In what was a languishing 
reconciliation and recognition process in Australia. It was the culmination of an Australian innovation, the First Nations regional constitutional dialogues that were conducted in 2016 and 2017 to elicit from a sample of First Nations communities what meaningful constitutional recognition is to them. The Uluru Statement from the Heart creates a roadmap for change developed by our people in their own voices because it is our own people in their own communities who know what is best for their communities. This is what the right to self-determination is about. The First Nations Regional Dialogues were conducted under the auspices of the Referendum Council and were the first of their kind since the Australian Constitutional Order commenced in 1901. Many Australians know that First Nations were excluded from the drafting of the Australian Constitution. Therefore, this process, the dialogue process, was unprecedented in our nation's history. And of the National Constitutional Convention held in 2017, it is the first time a constitutional convention has been convened with and for First Nations people. Thus the dialogue process and the Uluru Statement from the Heart is a profound response to historical exclusion from the Australian constitutional system. It is a profound response to the question, what does repair look like? 2017 was the year First Nations people issued the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the Australian people as an invitation. It was an important year. It was the 50th anniversary of the 1967 referendum. It was the 25th anniversary of the High Court's decision in Mabo. It was the 20th anniversary of the Bringing Them Home report. And it was 10 years since the suite of legislation known as the Northern Territory Emergency, Emergency Response was introduced. Each of these anniversaries bring with them a sentiment Aboriginal people know only too well that the law can oppress and the law can redeem. We know much about how the law can oppress. The law has played a role in the dispossession, oppression and subjugation of First Nations people from the frontier wars to Australia's very lengthy period of compulsory racial segregation, benignly known as the protection era to forced assimilation and stolen children and stolen wages. As the Constitution and the Federation and Australian, Australia's nationhood came into being, our people were being forced from country, herded onto reserves and missions. Unbeknown to many Australians from the late 1890s, Aboriginal people were the subject of draconian protection laws. Protection was required in part to prevent Aboriginal people from being indiscriminately murdered. It was the tail end of what we now know as Australia's first great wars, the frontier wars. My Davis family are cobble cobble people. They come from Warra, which is Barangum speaking country in southwest Queensland the lands bordering the Bunya Mountains and stretching out along the Condamine River. They were moved to Burumba Reserve, run by the Salvation Army at the turn of the century, around Federation. This reserve is today known as Sherberg. This move to protection is described in a book by Queensland historian Tom Blake. It's called 
Dumping Ground, A History of the Sherberg Settlement. He said the following. In the early months of 1901, as white Australians were undergoing their right of passage into nationhood, another group of Australians were also participating in a right of passage, but of quite different kind. In the Burnett district of southeast Queensland, remnants of the Waka Waka tribe were being rounded up and dumped on a reserve on the banks of Barumba Creek. From camps on the fringes of towns and station properties, they had been forced onto an Aboriginal settlement established ostensibly for their care and protection. For the Waka Waka, their right of passage was not into nationhood or independence, but into institutionalisation and domination. The two rituals were diametrically opposed. The brutality of the Australian state towards Aboriginal people imbues the constitutional system to this day. It is why I became a constitutional lawyer. Because constitutions can create the material conditions for a dignified human life. Constitutions can provide the fundamental resources and material conditions that humans require to live a flourishing life and for Indigenous self-determination. This is what a constitutionally guaranteed seat at the table on decisions made about our lives looks like. The Sherberg community has worked together to reclaim the old discarded ration shed, a symbol of the brutal regime of protection and unfreedom, where peas and porridge, flour, tea, sugar, rice, and salt were rationed out to people on the mission. The old shed has been restored together with the dormitories, and today it is a thriving cultural precinct. Sherberg's journey is an important one for the nation. It is complex. In Sherberg, they have reclaimed something that was brutal, even as the psychological and social manifestations of that, of that unfreedom, linger. This community has turned these dwellings into institutions of memory, survival, and reconciliation coming to terms with the past. This is the process that our nation is embarking on. The law can oppress, yes, but the law can also redeem. The Uluru Statement from the Heart has emerged from a constitutional recognition process in Australia that seeks to imbue the voice of First Nations people in the constitutional system, the ancient and modern polities of Australia, to anchor a process of agreement making and truth telling. The exigency of the voice to parliament is that the status quo isn't working for all of our people. Closing the gap is not working and in many areas it is going backwards. But the Uluru Statement is much more than that. After all that has happened, the question was, what does repair look like? It was voice, Makarata. It looks like voice, then treaty, then truth. When we ran the First Nations Dialogues, a deliberative process, aimed at eliciting from communities what meaningful constitutional recognition looks like, many of our people were cynical. And they have every right to be cynical. We said to them, law reform is about imagination. Law reform requires you to exercise your imagination and dream of a better day. What does a better world look like? Imagine that the world can be a better place for your family and your children and your grannies. 
Suspend your belief that Australia cannot change. Suspend your disbelief that you won't be heard. And on day two of the dialogue, they turned up, rolled up their sleeves and got down to work. These men and women, old and young, of the Uluru Dialogues gave up their weekend to come and think about how to improve our democracy, not just for them, but for all Australians. They decided not to present the Uluru Statement from the Heart to politicians. This is not about politicians. This is about Australians working together like 1967. At The Rock, we stared down the camera and talked directly to the Australian people to animate their agency and ask them to use their voice to help us get this across the line. Because retail Australian politics, ideology, set positions, tribalism and the left and the right will not get us there. The Constitution is meant to change. It is built to change by us, the Australian people. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is an invitation. It is a gift to you, the Australian people. Stan Grant Senior says that language is not about who you are, but about where we are. When people say that this is about changing the Australian identity, it is not. It is about location. We are located here together and we have to coexist in a peaceful way. We're about to face and are facing serious existential crisis as a people, as a humankind, as the climate changes and the planet warms up. The fundamental message from elders and traditional owners in the dialogues was that to face this battle together, the country needs peace. And the country cannot be at peace until we begin to resolve this issue, the original grievance. And the Uluru Statement is the beginning of that. Yes, Australia's democracy has been a successful democracy, but not for all, and not for the First Peoples. And after everything that has happened to our people, the killings, the massacres, the genocide, the compulsory racial segregation and the stealing of children and of wages and of land. The contemporary manifestation of this, youth detention, child detention, youth suicide, incarceration, child removals. Despite all of this, they chose love. They spoke of love. They spoke of peace. They issued an olive branch to the Australian people and they offer this to you sitting here in this room tonight, an invitation to walk with us. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the southern sky make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom, remain attached thereto 
and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are not, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at an unprecedented rate. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 19... <clears throat> In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. And we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you. Megan, thank you, and for reading the statement. Pat, if we can start talking about truth-telling and consensus building, and I'll let Megan catch her breath and have some water. Truth-telling can be painful for both the people who are telling the truth and the people who are hearing the truth. As a nation, how do we prepare for that? How do we prepare? I think there's been quite a lot of truth-telling more recently. Um, so people, Australians, are generally getting a bit more informed about us. We've still got a long way to go. Um, it's not an easy process, and it's a little bit more sophisticated than us sitting around with you spilling our guts. We've been doing that for a long time. So there has to be some meaning to this and some reconciliation um, so we can, somehow, as the statement calls for, some kind of coming together, some kind of relationship so we can all um, move forward. So that's truth telling and it's, like I said, it's, it's quite a sophisticated concept. It's already started uh, across the country. I think the, um, the Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody, what's it, 25 years even more than that, it's all down there to read. And also in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, from the report rather, the Referendum Council's report, 
the Uluru Statement is, is in fact 18 pages long. And it lists all the background and the story that leads up from our perspective to the Uluru Statement from the heart. So it's time, it's time for us all to have a mature and sophisticated, sophisticated conversation about who we are today. And I would just want to urge again what Megan said. We have to do things differently. I've been in this, I've been in this sort of space since I was 15. I'm a big number now, and I'm not going to tell you what that might be. But um, so there's lots of people like me of my generation. We've been hanging around for a really, really long time, over and over and over, saying the same things or similar things. William Cooper, the Yorta Yorta man, very famous activist from Victoria, sorry. Um, he first talked about a voice to Parliament. So since pretty much um, since the first boats came, we've been saying, hey, we're here and trying to tell our story and pleading with you to accept and to understand and acknowledge that we are the First Peoples and this is our place and we ain't going anywhere. It's time. It's time. Megan, about the pain of the process. We saw, for instance, with the referendum that wasn't a referendum and became an opinion poll on same-sex marriage, that that caused a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, and a lot of backlash. How do we avoid going through the negative part of that process and harness the positive? Um, right. Up I close. Guess. Up close. Um, I mean, I guess we talk about that, and many mob talk about that as you approach a referendum. Um, but I guess, you know, we manage it by discussing it up front, knowing that it's going to be a difficult campaign, drawing upon all sorts of, you know, will each other, hey, Pat, to, um, to, to manage that. But yeah, we know it's going to be difficult. We're not Pollyannas. Um, we're, we're preparing for it. But I think Pat's point is an important one. Australia is very quite a distance down truth tell, the truth-telling path. Um, let's not pretend we're starting now. We have a lot of lessons about what works and what doesn't work. So Pat referred to the Royal Commission. We know commissions of inquiry don't, don't work. We know Royal Commissions don't work. So there's a lot of work to be done with our people about what that truth-telling looks like. But, um, you know... It's um, an invitation for Australians to come and walk with us and, um, you know, we hope they accept that in the spirit that's intended. But to build this campaign and to forge ahead, you know, we just can't focus on the negatives and what's to come. We have to ensure that Australians understand what the Uluru Statement is and what the opportunity on the table for Australians, um, you know, is. And I think that's, that's really key to mitigating the, the issues that you raise about same-sex marriage. Inevitably, we saw, and we don't want history to repeat, but when Mabo was, the judgment was delivered by the High Court, we saw politicians exploiting the opportunity on behalf of their constituencies, in particular the mining and agriculture lobbies, and we were told that Indigenous people were going to come and claim the backyard and all of that scare campaign, which was um, horrific. So have we learned from history that there are always people who are going to try and stop the process? Do we learn that we have to anticipate those moves and how do we do that? Can I answer that? Please. Yeah, the Uluru Statement contemplates that, right? So... We had these conversations across the nation for two years. People don't go into referendums um, not knowing that it's going to be difficult. Most mob in the room would know any time our people put our head up above the parapet, where, whether it's being in a radio interview or a newspaper article or running a campaign, you're going to get racism. Like, we know that. Um, but the Uluru Statement was issued as an invitation to the Australian people because we wanted to avoid retail politics, the same politics that you're referring to. So we know if this gets bogged down in ideological battles between left and right, then that's what's going to happen. But our people decided not to go down that path. 
which is why we issued the Uluru Statement in the way that we did. The mining companies, the bulk of them have signed up to the Uluru Statement, the Business Council has, the Mining Council has. I think this is a very, very different era to the Mabo era. Um, again, I'm not saying we're Pollyannas, but I'm saying we're really cognizant of the really key moments in our history that involved recognition, and in that instance it was recognition of native title. We know we're the most over-scrutinised community in the country. We know what we're going to face. I think Noel calls us in the Boyer Lectures the most unloved group in the nation. But we know from the polling, you know, the rusted on 10% no or the rusted on 10% no, you know. Um, and we know that as we move around this country talking to Australians about this movement, um, that politicians have just resorted to what we expected them to do, set pieces, you know, set ideologies, tribalism, what we knew would happen. And so, you know, again, I just revert to the comment that this is an attempt via the dialogue process to actually go to Australians and help them persuade the nation of the exigency of this reform, but also politicians. And we saw that play out, right, in the last election. If you talk to the Teals, they would say the three issues that were coming up in their electorates were climate change, corruption and an integrity commission and the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, it was even coming up in, you know, electorates that have been National Party for the entire period since Federation, in Toowoomba and places like that. So, um, so you know, we hope that Australians view this and make, I think Pat's the most eloquent at talking about this, and that is read the information, read the Uluru Statement, read the 18 pages, read all of the information and be fully informed. Um, and then when the ballot box time comes, it's a decision um, of every individual Australian in their conscience about which way they want to go. But um, the Mabo era that you're talking about is one that is foremost in our mind as a number of other mm. periods are as we move forward. Pat, it would be ignoring the elephant in the corner of the room if we didn't talk about some of the people within the First Nations communities who do not share the majority view of the Uluru Statement and indeed Victorian Greens Senator Lydia Thorpe led a walkout and is still from time to time and she's toned down a bit of her criticism but together with um, people from the other side of politics there's a substantial body of opinion of people who even in the Indigenous community don't agree and Jacinta Price, number Jim Price is another one. What does from your point of view and from Alice Springs, you're familiar with all of these people. What's your best advice? You screw up with many of them. We are just like you. We come in all shapes, sizes and, and colours, okay? So everyone's got a different point of view about this. There is a lot of support amongst the, um, amongst the Aboriginal community across the country. But the people that were at the regional dialogue, just a little diversion here, um, where the people, they don't go on the drum, they don't write opinion pieces, they're not on Q&A, they're just out there mostly struggling, okay? Now, they turned up, I don't know, you know, they turned up for three days to talk about the Constitution, okay? And they did, and they did the really hard work. It was a long conversation, people were, we had to, uh, they were really concerned about some of the concepts and what have you, but they did it. They did it. They rolled up the sleeves because of the prize at the end, which is here, and it was a conscious decision to gift it to you. Rather than, and when, in fact, we just come from the bush and we went to, there was a big Q&A at Parliament House and Megan Noel and I walked in and the first thing we saw was the Bark Petition and the Barunga Statement and everything imprisoned behind glass. We said, this is never, never, ever is this going to hang in Parliament House for some politician at some stage decide to put it behind glass. It's actually returning um, to Mordajulu. I'm going a little bit off your question. Look, we all come in shapes and sizes. 
it's up to you. We can't cover all the information that you're going to hear. Misinformation, there's a ton of it out there. You don't know enough about us to make a discerning uh, opinion about it. But nevertheless, on polling day, when you're in the booth by yourself, there's only you and your conscience. You have to decide and take responsibility for that decision how you vote. We can't cover all the bases. It's really up to you. So we've been pleading with everybody across the country for the last five years, inform yourself. Try to find out as much as, as, much as you can. It's really important, whatever you, however way you vote, that it's an informed decision, that you engage your intellect and your heart and think about what sort of a country we're going to be from here on. What are our values? What do we stand for? Who are we? That's um, the question that you need to answer when you're in that polling booth by yourself with a pencil. So uh, lots of different people, lots of different... As it should be. As it should be. There's nothing wrong with differences um, of opinion. And they're all, they all have... They're entitled um, to their own views and opinions. Uh, but that's, that's the question that you have to answer when you're in the half-light uh, of the polling booth. Megan, do you want to say a word about Jacinta Price and Lydia Thorpe and the politics of it? Well, I mean, I don't agree with your assessment that there's a substantial number of the Indigenous community that's against it um, at all. In fact, the polling among our people shows that it's up to 80, 85% of our mob that support it. Um, look, they're politicians and they're entitled to their view. That's, that's all I have to say. Um, um, you know, our job is to take what was a historic consensus at Uluru and um, seek to have this reform implemented. The only point that I would make is, you know, there's no, you know, there's a deliberate sequence. Um, the Greens talk about a truth-telling process first, but what people said to us from grassroots communities right across the country was, We've done a lot of truth-telling. Mm. You know, our people go into the Royal Commission, bringing them home. Um, you know, other Royal Commissions on Youth Detention, Commissions of Inquiry in different jurisdictions. And all we do is tell our story over and over again in a kind of performative sense so that Australians can read it but not implement the recommendations. Um, and that, that's what has occurred in the bulk of the reports that our people have had to participate in. People are fatigued by that. You know, they don't want to keep telling their stories with nothing at the other end. The example or at least the experience in Canada and other places is, yeah, commissions of inquiries don't lead to any change. Canada's had four and it hasn't led to any substantive change among Canadians about their knowledge or understanding of First Nations peoples. Truth-telling um, in that kind of commission sense was not what the mob were talking about when they talked about truth-telling. That truth commission sense um, is a kind of confection that was applied by academics and others after Uluru because it, it meets um, the kind of you know, the body of transitional justice that emerged out of the 1990s with Latin American democracies as they were transitioning from dictatorships to liberal democracies. They needed to invent a way for victims and perpetrators to live together in a peaceful environment under the rule of law, the same as South Africa. After apartheid. After yeah. apartheid. And they created this process of truth and reconciliation, mm -hmm. truth and justice, but what you know from studying 30 years of those truth commissions is no one is satisfied from what happens in those commissions. So this kind of idea that we delay our rights, our inherent rights, for another commission was not something people wanted. When they talked about truth-telling, they talked about the work they already do in, in the Australian community, in their communities. Pat, you remember, at a local level, where they're working with local historical societies, local councils, local libraries. There's a lot of activity across, across the country of the families or descendants of people who were um, involved in frontier wars, people who murdered and massacred Aboriginal people, those families reaching out to 
community and wanting healing, you know, processes. At a hyper-local level. At a hyper-local level. Yeah. And so they said, where, you know, truth-telling is important, although the bulk of the conversation was focused on classrooms. Yeah. So primary schools and high schools, that's the bulk of what our mob said in all 13 dialogues. We need Australia, in Australian history, we need our version taught as well. Or not our version, but what happened to us as well. There was a really earnest lament in all of the dialogues um, that people said, starting in Broome, um, they used to say, don't they want to know our experience in our own country? Don't they want to know what happened to us? That, that, that was the question that, that led to the having to build the first day around dis- discussing Australian history um, because there was that kind of lament, how can they recognise us if they don't know us? But they don't want to delay their rights again. No. So if you think about Bob Hawke, committed to national land rights, then committed to treaty, then a WA election came along, and he didn't want that to impact his re-election or Labor's re-election chances. So you see his cabinet in the cabinet papers say, hmm, what are we going to do now? Oh, truth and justice. It was the 90s. So they had the South African reconciliation process and other things to draw upon. Um, Australians don't really know Aboriginal people. So we're going to send them down a 10-year process, statutory process, of reconciliation. And they created a statute called the Council of Aboriginal Reconciliation. They spent 10 years doing their work. You get to the end of that and the Howard government comes in and rejects it all. He just rejected it all. Then he created a false binary between symbolic reconciliation and practical reconciliation. And he walked down that path and he decoupled rights and recognition of our people from citizenship rights. Reconciliation Australia followed him and they created RAPs. RAPs have been studied and they're regard reconciliation action plans. They're regarded as unique in the world because they're the only reconciliation mechanism in the world that requires nothing of the state. It's all about private action. It asks nothing of the state. And so RAPs went that way or RA went that way with Howard and it took us 10, 20 years to recover. It was the Uluru Statement from the heart that brought, brought rights back to the table. It brought rights back to reconciliation. And that's why it's so important to have this implemented because we have a very skewed process in this country that promotes an idea of reconciliation that asks nothing of the state. Do we not fundamentally have to ask how racist are we? Is that not what it boils down to? Many people in this hall were brought up believing that the best thing to do for Aboriginal people in Australia was to smooth the pillow of the dying race, a phrase which I've spent months old. I've spent months looking for the origins of that particular phrase and I couldn't find it. But At the very core, and with my own family, I've experienced this, my own Indigenous family, I've experienced first-hand racism in Queensland, in the Northern Territory, in the Kimberley. Brazen, outspoken racism, even in the last few years. How racist are we? I mean, again, there's a lot of more in the room. We know racism, like, we've experienced it. Um... My son will go to a shop and be followed simply because he's dark-skinned. No one else will be. He will be. Yeah, I've had that experience. We all have. Yes, and yet white people don't understand that and they don't believe it when you tell them. I've taken family to a restaurant, dropped them out the front, gone to look for a car parking spot, come back, they're outside. I say, what's wrong? They say, oh, there aren't any tables. I go in and ask for a table, we're given a table straight away. Over and over. Yeah, mate, I know, I know. In the, you know my mum used to hide us black kids around the corner when she used to go and rent houses, right, yep. so that people couldn't see that we were coloured. But we have to talk about this, but no one I think ever does. We, I think we talk about it a lot. Um, 
Is there a national conversation about racism? Well, I mean, can I just can I just touch upon the AFL for a moment? Please, um, you're in the right place. You're yeah, in the right, right, town. right city, right town, right sport. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about what we're about to face, and look, we don't go into it the way that you know you're framing it. In that we don't go into it to go. Oh, Australians are really racist, this is never going to happen, because you can't go into a law reform process thinking it's not, going to be happen- it's not going to happen and be scared. One of the things that was really important about the process that we undertook was that there are a lot of old people in the dialogues who had been either children of the 1967 warriors or were 1967 warriors. And, and that period was no different to now, really, in terms of the, the, the racism that exists, right? Far North Queensland, I think, was the only area that really voted substantively no. Um, so we, can't, we don't go into this thing thinking it's not going to happen because everybody's so racist. We, we, we've gone into this thing as an opportunity, acknowledging everything that has come before us. We're not... Pollyanna's about what's happened. We're not pretending what happened has not happened. Um, But it is an unusual approach, Pat, I guess, um, in the way we presented the Uluru Statement as an opportunity for all Australians. Um, And and as I said, you know, the polling doesn't demonstrate this huge kind of racist sentiment of we're not going to vote for these blacks to be recognised or their voice to be recognised in the constitution. I think many Australians, at least what we can see, see this as an opportunity because it's a very pragmatic kind of reform, right? It's about inserting into the constitution the voice of the people that have lived here the longest and even racists understand that. Um, So... I mean, I, you know, we're, we're yet to get to the point where there will be a campaign run. We don't have a referendum bill yet. We don't have an amendment yet. Um, and so we all anticipate or face that journey ahead. Um, we're, not, we're not shirking away from that, but we don't view the Uluru Statement through a lens in which, um, you know, we're going to be just faced with blanket racism and we've seen a lot of that come straight out of the Mm. gates Um, but rather we've got to have those conversations with people about what it means I mean I Pat too we we all a lot of mob grow up in and amongst people that people would call racist you know my grandmother was probably she was racist Um, you know, we have to sit down with these people and have these conversations. You know, they are people that live across the road from my mum. They are people that I grew up with. We, we live amongst people that have racist views. And a lot of racism, if I can just put my United Nations hat on the table, a lot of it is about um, not knowing, um, lack of education, not knowing any Aboriginal people, there's a lot of, com- not complexity to racism, but there's a lot of, um, you know, we, we think that we can, um, you know, uh, lead this movement and this campaign through all of that. But it comes back to the, the kind of fundamental purpose of the Uluru Statement, um, which is about, as we said, it's about love and heart and hope. I don't know, Pat, I don't know if you want to add to that. For all of us over 18, this is going to be probably the most important thing you do when you get into that ballot box. Now, we have a lot of racism in our country, there's no doubt about it, but we have to, it's, it's there. We can't pretend that it isn't there. In fact, it's only just recently that, you know, we'd say that people wouldn't say racist or racism, they'd say the R word, because it was a really um, a, dirty, a dirty word. We have been generation after generation after generation of us have been subject to this. A lot of um, 
non-Indigenous Australians think that it happened way back in history. It didn't. Well, a lot happened then as well. But just taking my own family, for instance, just briefly, it was public policy of the day not, not to teach my mother to read and write. When I was at school growing up in Darwin, as an example, this is me now, um, the only job available to me because of who I was and where I lived, that I would be a cleaner, a domestic cleaner, either at the hospital or in a non-Indigenous woman's um, house. Nothing wrong with being a, a cleaner. Absolutely there is. That's not the point. But that was the only option available to me. And it just goes on and on and on. So we have an opportunity here to try to um, deal with that. Deal with who we are and try to be better people. That's what's on the table. That's what we're asking you to think about. As I said earlier, think about who we are, but we've got a long way to go. This is probably going to be one of the most difficult conversations we're ever going to have, well, for this generation, everybody over, over 18. But let's deal with it now. Don't leave it to our kids and our grannies. It really is time to do something, to, to, to deal to deal with all this stuff so we can, we can move on and reach, as a nation, um, our full uh, potential. Could you please thank Megan Davis and Pat Anderson and the remarkable work they've been doing on the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And now we have a treat, a real treat for you. John Wayne Parsons is a proud Yuggerabool and Merriam Lay man. And Yuggerabool, he explains to me, is the area southwest of Brisbane. And the Merriam Lay area is the eastern islands of the Torres Strait. He's a team leader, Indigenous student success at the University of Melbourne's Murrup Barak Centre. He's a composer, producer and performer whose singing practice is deeply embedded within his cultural identity. Could you please welcome John Wayne and his guitarist, Cisco, to the stage. Good evening. We've got a couple of little songs that I'd like to share with you. I think you've heard some good information tonight bit more clearer on the statement. So the statement, we know where it comes from, Uluru. And I've got a song, and we're on Nam. I want to honour the Kulin Nations, Uncle Andrew at the beginning, for their beautiful welcome. I'm a proud Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander man from Queensland, and I honour the people here today. I want to share some songs from my country, Nyagara country. Garing in the Nami, Juju Munberunu. Garing in the Nami, Garing in the Nami, Juju Munberunu. Garing in the Nami, Juju Munberunu. Garing in the Nami, Juju Munberunu. Kayang man maranga. Kayan man maranga, jalban mun ganyungu, garing in the nami, juju mun beruno. Garing in the nami, juju mun beruno. Garing in the nami, garing in the nami, juju mun beruno. That song talks about coming from the north, east, south and west. And when you come, you come with good spirit. And when you go, you take that good spirit with you. Garing in the Nami, Juju Mun Beruno. Garing in the Nami, Garing in the Nami, Juju Mun Beruno. Garing in the Nami, Juju Mun Beruno. 
Starring in the Nabe, Jojo Munberono, Kayan Man Marangai, Kayan Man Marangai, Alban Gungan Yungu, Kayan Man Marangai, Alban Gungan Yungu. Garing in the Nami, Jojo Munberuno, Garing in the Nami, Garing in the Nami, Jojo Munberuno, 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 Garing in the Nami. Thank you. This next song, I'm proud of both of my cultural heritages, Aboriginal and Torres Strait. And like our brother introduced me from the Eastern Islands of the Torres Straits. I've got connections throughout the Torres Straits, but the Eastern Islands of the Torres Straits, over where Mabo country, very close where the big Great Barrier Reef starts. There's a couple of islands there, Mare, Murray Island, Erab, Danley Island, Ugar, Stephen Island. That's where my family come from. It's one of the lonely islands in the Torres Straits. Very small. So this song's called Terge. And I want you to think about the song as I sing. This one's about the ocean, about the waves and how it crashes. And when it crashes, you see the sprays. I like to think those sprays, and I use the metaphor, that those sprays are the voices of my ancestors. What's your ancestors telling you today? This song's called Teir Gear.
Upemsi Barapeda My soul Menami Igali My soul Menami Igali 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 Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Thank you to John Wayne Parsons and Cisco. What a wonderful, wonderful way to round out our gathering here today. Formal thanks are to be given by Sally Capp, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, the first woman directly elected to that prestigious and historic position. A passionate advocate for our city, Sally has steered us through COVID-19 and is now deeply embedded in being the champion of our recovery. Could you welcome her to her stage in her town hall? Wow, wow, wow. How remarkable and momentous that we are all here this evening with the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the leaders who brought this important dialogue together. To Megan Davis and to Pat Anderson AO, thank you. I, I, I've got shivers and I know everybody here uh, is in the sa feeling the same way. Now, I had a long speech prepared, you'd be so pleased, a long speech prepared this evening that outlined many of the projects that the City of Melbourne has underway to govern with and respect the traditional owners of the land on which we govern here in our municipality, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and the Bunurong Boonwurrung people, and I now pay my respects to their elders past and present. My speech also outlined the many initiatives that we have to honour the unbroken spiritual, cultural and political connection that the Wurundjeri, the Bunurong, the Jajawurrung, the Tungurung and the Wadawurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin have with this unique place called Nam and have had for more than 2,000 generations. And whilst the work that we're doing, that we're all doing, is valuable, tonight is not about the city of Melbourne. It is about the brave and impressive group of leaders who developed the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It is about the activism and persistence of the traditional owners of Australia. It is about their ongoing generosity and warmth in still wanting to share their ancient culture after more than 200 years of neglect and devastation. It's about the power of vulnerability through truth-telling and the opportunity to empower our First Nations people. It's about non-Aboriginal Australians saying, not only do we hear you, but that we are actively listening, that we are standing with you, beside you, behind you, and even in front of you when necessary as you lead change. It's that we accept this gift that is the First Nations ancient culture and we do so with respect and humility and that together we will build a fair and truthful relationship so that Australia and all Aussies, all Aussies can flourish. That's what tonight has been about for me. That's what the Uluru Statement of the Heart represents for all of us. And I congratulate and thank Noel Pearson 
and Megan Davis and Pat Anderson AO for their incredible leadership, for winning the Sydney Peace Prize and for, with other leaders, developing the Uluru Statement of the Heart. And now it is up to all of us to deliver it together. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It seems trite, but still worth remarking that progress is not inevitable, nor is it linear. It doesn't just happen in an orderly fashion. It happens because we, you, all of us, it happens because we make it happen. And we make it happen by being active participants instead of passive observers. Could you please once more thank Uncle Andrew Gardner, Duncan Maskell, Archie Law, Megan Davis and Pat Anderson in particular, John Wayne Parsons and Cisco and Lord Mayor Sally Cap. Thank you all for coming along on a, a night when everyone had an excuse not to come to the town hall with terrible weather and the threat of another COVID wave, but you have and you've voted with your feet. It's been a wonderful and a moving evening Thank you for all coming. Thank you to our speakers and have a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>